Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, I'm sir. Good, hi. Our stupid reactions. Tune in for the. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to meet you. How are you uh, during uh, during this whole self isolation? I'm good. I'm, we've been watching a lot of old noir. We're doing a Hitchcock and a Fritz Lang. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. What's your favorite Hitchcock film? Oh, the, I don't know. That far too many. I, I, you can't say it. Like <laughs> <laughs> anything from Frenzy to Rope to I don't know Psycho, Man Who Knew Too Much, everything. A whole <laughs> lot of stuff. But I'm now. We're now watching a lot of old movies. Oh. I just saw The Lodger, and I saw. Uh, Young and innocent. That's awesome. Yeah, I love I, Hitchcock. Obviously, is amazing. I don't have to tell you that. Um, but um, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And it, I wanted to ask you during this um, kind of almost self isolation uh, that's going through. Is how is it going for you as a writer? Is it more helpful as a writer being able to just sit down and being able to write as much as you want, or is it is it actually more painstaking? Oh, uh, it is. I don't know. I, I have not been able to write at all. Okay. Back there. Perfect. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, but no, yeah. No, I've actually been trying to write for... Uh, there's a movie I was shooting just before the lockdown happened and I had three, four days away from the shoot. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wrote some scenarios for that, which is my work in progress. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the other writing that I was supposed to do last two and a half weeks, I have actually not been writing at all. Really? Yeah. And so you said you had four days left on a on a on a current shoot. Yeah, I had four days left. So I still have four days left. So whenever the lockdown gets over, I finish my film. Oh dang! Mm. <laughs> so is this is this is this break from writing frustrating, or is it actually nice? Oh no, I I. I I write like in a flow. When I write, mm-hmm. I write in a flow. Yeah. My writing is like a burst of like I. It's always a burst. So yeah. I write and I'll sit and I'll write till I finish. It often always happens. Uh, very close to shoot, so I always know mm-hmm. what I'm going to do and I narrate everything to people and get the team together and I write just before we are going into the shoot. So normally that's how writing happens. So you, so you yeah, that actually. It was- Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, like, you're one of those writers that doesn't like write every single day. You almost write when inspiration happens and kind of like, it, yeah. like that. More, more like that than like. I a, write when inspiration happens and I write in a burst. I write to finish. When I write, I finish my draft. And then I keep doing corrections as I go along in the shoot. So. Mm. Mm. Even when I'm working with somebody else's script, I work like that. So, a lot of rewriting happens while you are in the shoot. Mm hmm. What what originally made you? Because I know you're, you originally wrote a lot. I mean, I know you you acted uh, as well, but uh, you're originally, I think, a writer turned director. Yeah. Um, and so, what made you want to be a writer? I don't know. I, I have been writing since I was a kid. So, I was writing when I was nine years old. I was writing when I was ten years old, and I was writing pre dark stuff when I was nine, ten years old. So, mm. that would scare a lot of people. Like my. my my school magazine wouldn't publish what I wrote because they thought it was too dark. Really? Dang. Yeah, I would like nobody. Like I, I was so conscious of my what I wrote because I felt things very strongly mm-hmm. that I, I didn't ever showed it to anyone. So mm, I really? think somewhere, somewhere when I started watching a lot of cinema from the world over. Mostly international cinema, not Indian cinema. When I started seeing a lot of European cinema, I started getting confident that what I wrote was actually good stuff. Because until then, I thought uh, I, 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 my writing is not very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually a, a question I had for you because a common theme in your films and the shows that you, whether you're writing, directing, or producing, there seems to be often this common theme about depravity in us as well as the 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 nature of evil but at the same time one of the things that is so astonishing to me is your capacity to present characters 
that uh, are never demonized. So is, is that intentional yeah. when you write or is that just a byproduct of your ability to create believable characters? No, I, I think that's somewhere that I, I, I see things as well because so very early on, like uh, when I was growing up in a very small town in India and I was, uh, we were primarily Hindi speaking, I never spoke a word of English and we used to read a lot of Hindi literature and that was the time a lot of Russian literature was published in Hindi. So very early on in life, I was very influenced by Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. by, by Tolstoy, by, by, I read a whole lot of that literature in Hindi. I did not mm -hmm. read it in English or, or any other language, I read it in Hindi. And also being a loner, you tend to think things and you tend to see things a certain way. And, and also that whole belief system that people are not born a certain way, you don't, you don't judge people for what they do. And I've always been curious about why somebody would do something so heinous as kill someone. Mm -hmm. What makes somebody seemingly so normal? Because I've seen this happen in this. Growing up in this very small town, I've known someone who later in life turned out to be someone who murdered somebody, not intentionally, out of anger, across my house. I've seen things like somebody, somebody I, I probably played with. And it was somebody who showed us movies on VHS that were kind of forbidden because, you know, we were young kids and somebody who'd show us, say, Mechanus Gold. And it was forbidden because in Mechanus Gold, there's this one sequence where you see the breasts of the actress. Mm -hmm. As kids, as nine, ten years old, you like see that and you're like very wide-eyed and in India, you can't see that. Somebody who showed us that we got kidnapped mm -hmm. when we grew up much later and I was studying in a boarding school. When things like that happen around you, when I was growing up in Uttar Pradesh in India, near a place where like, you know, near a place which is considered to be the crime capital. So you see things and you start thinking because, you know, you don't tend to see people the way the world sees them. Mm -hmm. You want to get into their humanity. You want to see what makes them the way they are. Yeah. And I've always been very bored by it. Very nice guys bore me. Yeah, <laughs> I can yeah. I can relate. Uh, the uh, yeah. we, we actually just watched your um, uh, Raman uh, Raghav uh, two point uh, oh. phenomenal. By the you way, you saw which version? Which version do you see? Uh, there are two versions of the film. Oh really? I don't. Where did you see it? Where we saw it on YouTube. That's the only place we could find it. Oh okay. No, there's a there's a preferred version which is European, which which is mostly all over the Europe. It's like you'll find a. If you can find a version that's in Germany or Spain and things, that that's a. So what what's the difference of those? Is it a director's cut? It's just different. Uh, the Indian the Indian version was much more linear because uh, in India they don't like to play with structure. Yeah. Indian version was much more linear. Yeah. Is it's a minor minor change, but it changes a lot in the film. Indian version explains things a little bit more. Really. Now I yeah. want. Now I want to find it. The world, uh, the, I'm talking about the version that played at the Cannes Film Festival. That's a different version. It's, it's a more European version. Well, I want to. I want to <laughs> find that now. Um, but yeah, yeah. We, we were talking about in it that it kind of on what you were just talking about how one it doesn't feel like in uh, in gangs and and ugly and 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 that that you you don't ever judge your characters and you also don't let the audience yeah. judge your characters. And so at one point, you, you obviously, um, Nawaz's character is, you're like, he's a despicable person. But at the end of it, you're like, Rick said that you, you wonder if he's almost an anti-hero kind of uh, a little bit yeah. at, the, at the end. And so um, I, I was also wondering, though, a lot of your films that you've not only written, directed, but also produced, um, Lunchbox, uh, Udan, uh, other ones like that are some of our favorites for one, but they're also very digestible for Western audiences. Um, yeah. And so, is that something you purposely write, uh, like purposely think about? Uh, well, because there are some no, films I in India. Like, in the sense, no, I don't think like that. In the sense, I just don't like the unnecessary melodrama of Indian cinema. Uh -huh. And even if I, if I put that in my movie, my movies, movies will be much bigger successes than they are. Oh. Like, you know, but the thing is, I, I, I just can't do it. I can't bring down to bring myself down to spoon feed or justify a certain things because see, uh, 
my education is very different like mostly in the film industry is full of people who are born within the film industry yeah so it, it just fell <laughs> right no worries no that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so our film industry is mostly people who are born within the film industry uh-huh. so they they have grown up watching cinema that's already produced the mm-hmm. idea of the world comes from cinema and my idea of the world comes from life my idea of the world comes from a whole lot of other things this is i did mm. not grow up on indian cinema as much as i grew up from i grew up studying i i, I discovered cinema much too late in life mm. and and when i found cinema i i got into cinema and uh well, the thing is the i used to read a lot because i spent most of my time in the library so what happens is the one i i got my passport in say 19 uh i got a passport in 2004 5 like i was 34 32 years old mm. i did not have a passport before that so when you grow up in a small town in india you travel the world through books and you travel mm. the world through cinema and and you get into people's heads so it, it's not really deliberate in the sense i i am very aware of uh, the kind of movies i'm making and i am also aware of it does not reach out to the core indian cin- audience the cinema audience mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it doesn't explain so much it doesn't simplify so much it i like complex characters mm-hmm. and by creating complexity in movies you also lose audience so hence i work backwards in the sense i work on very low budget mm-hmm. i work mm-hmm. on low budget so that the budgets often force you to change creative, your approach to yeah. cinema yeah yeah every and I, every, every time i got money to spend on films I have not been had that full freedom. I had to always mm. cut out the complexity from the film. I have to simplify it. Uh. I have to cater cater more to the audience because you need a broad base audience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For yeah. for a for a much more much more tighter audience, I can retain my complexities with the character. So like yeah. knowing, say for example, Saikhu Ramon or Ramon Raghav, I you I know beforehand that the how much the film is going to work on box office. So how I work is I go to my producer and ask him how much money will you give me if I do not give you a script and I don't tell you who's in it just to make a film. <laughs> That's so awesome. So it is then then they they give me a figure and I work backwards. So with say for example with Saikuraman I got a figure and I know that I cannot shoot more than 20 days. So I sit down mm-hmm. and write the script to make it in a way that I can shoot it in 20 days. So mm-hmm. that's why the chapters, because chapters help me jump. Ah, oh. mm-hmm. interesting. So, I, I, so every chapter becomes like I, I go into one location and I shoot one chunk. I go into mm-hmm. another location, I shoot one chunk. So that's how I would design my film. So it it is working backwards, but the 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 point of the film was in the end, like in the scene. There's a sequence. There's a song sequence. In the pre climax. when you see the burning of the ravan mm-hmm. and the, all the rituals mm-hmm. so what happened was like at the time of the shoot is probably it was coinciding that the way india is the political atmosphere of india is such right now at the moment where everybody is very insecure mm-hmm. so there's all the religions first time came out in the streets in numbers as a show of strength all the festivals became a show of strength for religions various religion and that kind of became the commentary in the film so mm. all the visuals that you see of people are real visuals i have not created mm-hmm. it that was happening on the street i went we went there with the camera and shot it as it is and mm. that becomes the kind of a narrative in the climactic scene because the entire film was made only for the last sequence the conversation between the two about yeah. mm. what's evil and what is what is a perceived evil and what is an evil that we trust so much and we don't know it is evil there's a evil that we supposed to trust like for example the police we are supposed to trust but in india we are afraid of the police mm. we don't trust the police we are afraid of the police mm-hmm. i'm saying we are supposed to feel secure but we are insecure God. and i'm saying there is the summary and I, the whole conversation in the end was what the whole film was driving at but i had to also do it in a way where it's like a genre film in a mm-hmm. genre piece you can be political you can be complex you can be so much more for people for the discerning eye for people who understand it is fine for people who don't understand it they just see it as a serial killer film mm-hmm. yeah what once sorry rick you can uh, can you turn your camera <coughs> yeah. a little right there 
Yeah, right there. You're good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, you've mentioned a few times about the working of the music in the films, and I've had found that uh, oftentimes the, the score it seems to have little musical symmetry. Like I bet if I listened to the score of Ugly or Raman Raghav and I showed those songs to people, they wouldn't even know they came from the same film. Yeah. But when you see them as a whole, there's this congruency that it, it all seems like it's supposed to fit. And I, I, how closely do you work with your composers I, in I, that I regard? Work with, I, love, I work a lot of music. Yeah, like for me, it music like is it. extremely important. Uh, music became, because when I was writing my first movie, there was no music in it. It's a movie called Panch. And uh, it was a movie about these four students based on a real story who kind of go on a crime spree because they want a good life. And and that film, to make that film, instead of four struggling students, I had to turn them into a, a four members of a band. I made them into members of a band because if you don't have songs, nobody wants to produce a movie. Mm-hmm. And I come from a school where I can't have an actor suddenly breaking into a song. <laughs> with, my, with my first film, I didn't know how to put in a song. So I had to make them a member of a band. They were professional singers. And I wanted to get to my story fast. So my first movie, if you see, it's very hard. It's, it's there on YouTube, but I don't think it has subtitles. I never released it. got banned in India. But uh, my first film had first... 25 minutes of the movie was just music, songs, songs, songs. When I said, you want songs, I'll give you songs and then let me get to the story. And then there's the story. <laughs> yep, so, I, we see that my, in your film, sir. We see that in your films, absolutely. I, <laughs> Here's your music. That was, that's my relationship my with story. music. You should have. Yeah, yeah, over, over a period, I think I, I figured out how to integrate music with my film. And because I, I, I love music so much and... Uh, my taste in music depends a lot on what I'm listening at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, so what I do is I work on music over a period of time and I make it part of the narrative. And m- music always becomes part of the script and part of the narration. So if people are breaking into a song and dance, which is a rule that I've probably broken only once, they have to play the part of a singer. They have to play a professional singer or something. Otherwise, that rule I've broken only once in my movie. Like, but other than that, they're only playing in the background score and they are adding to the film what I cannot put in the script, mostly because of uh, the reasons of censorship. So most of the songs, if you bring them down, kind of becomes political. Mostly like, say, for example, Gangs of Asipur songs are extremely political, they're sexual and political. And mm-hmm. for Indian movies, the key things that you cannot put in the movies is sex, sexuality, politics and religion. Three things are a big no for Indian cinema, and I, and those are my three preoccupations. <laughs> so I cannot make a film without those three. Yeah, so yeah. You, so, so, so I I need to find ways to put that in, and songs often become the way to put it in. My so, songs are very mm, political. We we saw Sacred Games, which we love. Sacred Games. Yeah. Um. And do you prefer that medium working with Netflix, since you don't really have those constraints? I like working with Netflix. I've, I've been having yeah. a great, great time working with them because not just that, a lot of my movies that did not find, say for example, Raman Raghav and for example, Ugly and, and The Girl in Yellow Boots, all these movies found a much, much bigger audience after they came on Netflix than they found mm. in theatre. Mm. So the amount of feedback and mails and the response I got for my movies after they came on Netflix, the movies that make people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, they, they became much more popular because of the OTT platforms than they were on the release. But I've always got great reviews and they played at festivals, but somehow there's always a lack of box office. There's a lack of number of people who see it at the time of release. So people generally discover my films later. Yeah. After they hear. And by that time, it doesn't stay in cinemas in India because we have very limited cinemas. So with the with the advent of Netflix and Amazon, I think I've found a much larger audience than I had when those films actually came out. I, I have a question for you because um, a lot there's a variance of difference of opinion on this matter from filmmakers, even Martin Scorsese, who I know you know. Um, do, would you like to do a film and have it go straight to a streaming service so you don't have those constraints? No, or... I, as a filmmaker, I would love to see my movie on screen. Yeah. 
but but uh, as an indian filmmaker we don't have that advantage not because of netflix wouldn't do it netflix is willing to do something like that mm-hmm. but the indian theater theater owners would not play a film even for a week if it's going on netflix Mm. Gotcha. So you can't so do the what they problem. do here, right? You can't do a limited release there and then put it on streaming like no, we do here. You can do that in the US. You can do it that in yeah. parts of Europe or right. UK, but you can't do that in India because the cinema exhibitors won't do that. Exhibitors don't even give uh, give cinemas to do a premiere for movies that are going on Netflix. Mm. They they wow. do that for a web series, like for example, Sacred Games. We premiered in a screen of cinemas, whereas the movies that go on Netflix. one couldn't find cinema to screen them because it was a competition to them even hmm. for a premiere wow so that's a that's a kind of a interesting but you can do that outside india yeah yeah you know almost i w- everything we've seen that you've done whether you've written it directed or produced it they all are uh, very digestible to western audiences and what they expect yeah. in cinema um how much of that we we we've, we've often said that um we think you are someone who could instantly become a household name here in the United States like other directors who don't come from America somehow, somehow most of our movies haven't i like we i found a massive audience in europe mostly in mm-hmm. spain germany france italy but except lunchbox none of our films have managed to have had a breakthrough in the us or canada like i've had a lot of movies that have played at the tiff Toronto Film Festival, mm-hmm. uh-huh. and but barring Lunchbox, none of our movies have had a kind of a breakthrough in the US. Gangs of Wasipur had a breakthrough on the online OTT platform mm-hmm. because it was picked up by a distributor and it got a great Blu-ray release in US. But it found success on Netflix when they released it as a six-part series. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can, I, I think that's because one, Americans. Don't like reading subtitles. Uh, yeah. Two Americans have a very short attention span, and so releasing. Yeah. I, I know Gangs of Wasper, which is probably my favorite. I think it's the best gangster film of all time. Um, but the fact that it's what five five and a half hours long uh, would intim- yeah. immediately intimidate any American. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, <laughs> that's I, the reason it didn't find any distribution. Yeah, which yeah, which maybe, which is un yeah. which is unfortunate <laughs> because it's it's yeah. so it's so phenomenal. But do you have a um, do you have any aspirations to do any Hollywood films at all, or 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 not? No, not? I've been I, I, I've been like since Black Friday, two thousand five. I have had an agent in the US, mm-hmm. and uh, I've just been very resistant to it until two three years ago. until 2 mm-hmm. three years ago I was very resistant to it because I'm very self conscious of my language so when I watch an american movie I put the subtitles on even for english language movies hmm. because mm-hmm. I want to understand everything and I feel like I don't understand things mm-hmm. and then I was I was on the jury in Sundance in 2013 I think the year gangs of wasipur came out and played at Sundance and uh and Park Chan Wook had made a movie called Stoked Mm-hmm. with Nicole Kidman. Mm-hmm. And he's a very good friend. So I asked him like how did you manage to make a film in Hollywood? And he told me a very simple thing. He says all you have to do is pretend you don't understand English. <laughs> so when you really? pretend that you don't understand English, they leave you alone. But for me I was like by then everybody knew that I spoke English. <laughs> could understand it. And I said had I, had, had I met him much before, he says the moment they know you understand their language, everybody wants to tell you how to make a movie. Ah, uh, so this is when you they, they know you, they have to talk to you through somebody a mediator you get your get a free hand in making a movie. So I've had I've I've got so many filmmakers from across the world. Their experiences in Hollywood has been very very strange in the sense, like I know Fatih Akin was trying to make a film and he had signed the contract with Focus Features and the signing the contract it went on for so long time and then he gave up and he came back and decided I don't want to work in Hollywood. I've had. a lot of filmmakers who have had some very strange experiences and then they came this phase in hollywood the phase that where i was at where they were picking up filmmakers from across the world who were playing movies at the festivals and they were all getting movies with like say bruce willis and schwarzenegger and stallone and things and they were trying to make these packages with filmmakers mm-hmm. from across the world i didn't want to do movies like that 
Mm-hmm. I did not want to do. I wanted to do more personal, intimate, smaller movies, which now I have started. Now I'm a little more confident, and and in the sense of dealing with people, I have a great agent there, and I have good people, and we've been talking now to figure out something that I would like to do, which is much more under the radar, quite a smaller, more personal, uh, rather I, than something much out there and much louder. I would love that, and I'm I'm hoping it's. It's changing in Hollywood with the Parasite winning the Oscar. Uh, and, and no, it's been changing for the last two years. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and the fact that Guillermo del Toro uh, won and the and, and uh, Anya Hanyo and Yuritu. So we're we're hoping you can join that conversation of ones that no, have the, actually. There's a there's a lot of good things happening. I'm seeing just the movie, say for example, Birds of Prey, mm-hmm. directed by mm-hmm. an independent filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, so bad boys is these two belgian filmmakers who came in like you know yeah. who have no history in hollywood so they they are now actually looking at they've understood that the hunger for a filmmaker to tell the story is much more from people who are coming from outside rather than play the hollywood game yep so i think it is changing i've seen this change in perspective in last 2 years so most of the work that i'm doing right now is back from outside only it is it's not back here as much So you're you're out you're out, though, of, you're, even, you're out of shot. There, cool, good. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm 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 doing a lot of work for OTT platforms and mostly I, my my preferred platform is Netflix. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Doing a lot of work at Netflix, but it's also uh, it's, it's back very strongly from there. So it's in a good space right now at the moment. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and is that would you say? And you could answer this question from a multiple of perspectives because you're you're an actor, you're a writer, you're a director, you're a producer. When we were speaking with, uh, yeah, <laughs> I know you. I hate you I, but you, when we were speaking with Nawazuddin and Siddiqui about his approach to characters and if he would prefer to be in a character for a stretch of time like Sacred Games versus being able to do it for 20 days on a film, he said he loved, and it didn't surprise me, especially because he has a theater background, that he loved the process of being a character for an extended amount of time like Sacred yeah. Games. Is that your preference as a creator, uh, a series versus a film, or it's it's two completely different I, I, I like the I like the idea of a series. Mm-hmm. Because I like to tell the whole story. Yeah. So many times my problem is that I need more time. I yeah, need more right. time to t- tell tell a story. I sometimes, like some films like say Ugly and uh, Raman Raghav, they're fine. But there's so many other movies like the movie that I made, Mukhabaz. I probably would have made a much longer movie. Mm. Or, or Black Friday. Black Friday was probably I, I would have made it like a gangster basketball. We actually shot and had a four and a half hour version. And then really? it, when it was, yeah, and then it got banned, and after that, by the time it got cleared, we lost a lot of the film in the lab. So what came out was the two hour forty minute version, which was still very powerful, but we lost a lot of material. Mm. Wow. So I, I like telling longer stories. Yeah, yeah, you, you, it was a <laughs> Sacred Games, one of our favorite series. We yeah. one, I loved the ending of the Sacred Games. I did want to ask you one question, though. I know you didn't direct the second season, but you were obviously heavily involved. No, I did the second. I did the second season as well. You directed? It, yeah, me and Neeraj came on. We directed second. Oh, okay, season. you directed, I directed together. All the, okay, that's sorry. Yeah. I did. Okay, um, but the there was one part that I wanted to know because I hated her so much. <laughs> uh, uh, at the end, when they're trying to figure out the code, right? Spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen yeah. it. Go away. Uh, the she this woman comes up who's supposed to be a, a tech expert. She just pu- inputs a yeah. random like pattern like two or three times, <laughs> and I wanted to shoot yeah. her in the face so much. <laughs> so can you explain the logic behind what she did there? Because <laughs> hey, uh, I, I really uh, I I can't explain that to you because that was. Not my chunk, and I I don't even we don't even read each other's scripts. Gotcha. So, because we have a boss sitting on top of our head. Gotcha. Okay. Like, there's we have a we have a right. Got it. Got it. Got it. together. So. I just I just wanted Got to know it. if you knew because I we we reacted to that like in um we did a live reaction so people saw my reaction and I shouted multiple times just shoot her in the face, Sartaj. <laughs> <laughs> I hated her so you know, much. Think, you know, sometimes it sometimes it works because there's always this character that you hate so much and yeah. irritates you because it's it's like it's just killing time when when there's a race against time. Yeah, so oh, yeah. those characters work very well because they engage, they pull you in much more because you start getting personally involved. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I love the ending, though. I love that you didn't answer it and you kind of left it open for interpretation. I loved that. Um, so, the, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, the uh, what I wanted to have a, a question about. You've worked with Noaz a lot, and you yeah. almost uh, gave him his biggest break. Obviously, uh, he talked about how when you casted him in Gangs of Wasper, um that somebody came up and said, "Who's your lead?" And and I think you you pointed to Noaz, and they were like, "Oh, this will never work." Obviously, he yeah. he, he doesn't look that, like. That, a, that, he, that, he, he doesn't look like a hero. So what? How? When did you know that Nawaz was as good as he is? Because in my opinion, he's one of the greatest actors I've ever seen. Yeah, Nawaz is a not just a brilliant actor; he's an incredible screen presence. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. me, like I, uh, Nawaz's first role, I cast him because I was a casting director at that time, as well as writer, which was a movie called Shul, which I wrote and and I was casting, and Nawaz was in dire need of money. Mm-hmm. And and I said there's nothing good for you. And he said I'll just come and work because I just need my lunch money. Uh-huh. So he did a one scene role in that movie called Shul. And after that, we worked again on Black Friday. Uh-huh. And Black Friday is where I discovered him because Black Friday he was just a good actor for me, and he's just one of the many good actors who were on the set. Yeah. And I, while I was shooting with him, in a very crucial scene, a scene that a whole lot of people love. And there was this my assistant, who's also been my co-writer, standing next to me. This woman, who was from the same acting school as Nawaz was, but she wanted to be more in direction. And while Nawaz was performing, she was kind of talking to herself, and she was gushing over him about, "She look at his eyes, look at his eyes, they're so beautiful." Mm. And I was like listening to her, and that's it's 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 it was almost like a prompt. She prompted yeah. me, and I looked at Nawaz very differently. I was suddenly like, mm. "Oh, there's a woman talking about Nawaz, how beautiful his eyes were." Mm. And then I tried to look at Nawaz from a perspective of, say, a woman, or from a perspective of a filmmaker. I never saw him that deeply before that day, mm. and I realized the man is somebody else on camera. He holds the camera because if you see him off screen. If you see him on the street, you will not notice him. Yeah. If he'll come and sit mm-hmm. quietly next to you, you would not know that he's come and sit, and he's the main actor in the show. Yeah. He's so. He, yeah. It's like you know, mm-hmm. he has properties of copper. Yeah. Like he's malleable and ductile. Like you can shape him any which way. And yeah. He's like that. And when he's on screen, his person persona is so huge and so much more larger. So what really helps is because he does not have a persona off camera, mm. that it doesn't restrict me into cast him in a manner that if you see most of the actors, very good actors like you see Pacino is such a great actor, De Niro is such a great actor, but you know it's a Pacino and a De Niro whether they're on screen or off screen. Yep. With Nawaz, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. But Nawaz becomes a character on screen, but off screen he disappears. Yeah. So it it kind of helps me. I can think of him in various ways, and he'll come in and he'll totally surrender. He'll just get into this. Like while doing Raman Raga, he fell ill twice. <coughs> he got into it so badly. He got dengue. He was in a hospital, and while in the hospital, he was only just constantly blabbering lines from Psycho Ram from Raman Raga. Mm-hmm. As if like he was literally reliving the character, wow. and he was on a high yeah. fever, and his his wife called me and she said, "What have you done to him?" And he's just like yeah. talking nonstop lines from a movie, and I got scared. I said like you know, and he was really affected by it. So he becomes like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, and he likes to live there. He likes to stay there because he actually prefers that world. He escapes into that world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when Can he's you... playing a character, he escapes into that yeah. world. Can you he, push your he... camera back? I'm sorry. You just yeah I, he, I don't I keep missing you go ahead thank you he um, in in Raman Raghav um, one of the things that was so astonishing about Nawaz in that was um, I could actually he was obviously playing someone who was sociopathic but it wasn't just in the dialogue and it wasn't just in what he was doing and being the character but it was literally as if I could see there was a psychosis in the inner monologue yeah uh, that, that monologue I wrote in. That monologue I wrote back in 
Really? <laughs> uh, it, it is from it is from a play that I. It is the first piece of writing that I did when I came to the city. In 1993, I wrote a play, and that started with this monologue, which was about this uh, person who has killed somebody in the street, and the police picks him up, and they're talking to him, and he's talking about why he killed that person, mm. and how I, I wrote wrote it back in 1993. So when I was about to make this movie, Ravan Raga. I actually wanted to make a biopic, but my movie Bombay Velvet didn't work. It was a big disaster, and everybody pulled the plug on Raman Raga. So I, we had the material, and Vasan Bala, who was a writer on Raman Raga, he had done a lot of work on it. So I took his material, and I tried to, I made the film into a contemporary film, and it became a political statement. So that whole him his monologue piece, I called a friend of mine who had my plays. That I wrote in 1993. He had all my writing from then with him, and he does theater in Delhi. And I asked him, and he sent me screenshots of the play. And from the screenshots, I rewrote the monologue. Ah. And that monologue piece was written in 19. 90- I was 21 years old when I wrote that piece. Wow. Really, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah that that was that was yeah. such a phenomenal scene uh, with what you did with it, and what obviously Nawaz did. With it. He's so. Natural yeah, in, in what he does. Um, I did want to talk about more uh, the acting uh, of uh, your process with one casting and acting. But there was another scene that I want to talk about as well. In Ugly, I'm sure it's one of the most famous scenes in it. Was the when they're in the police station? The police station scene. Yes, the police station. Uh, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I want to talk about. It was. Uh, I heard so it was supposed good. to be one minute, and then that you just let them go. And you didn't, and they were kind of improvising, and it all came out to be a fourteen-minute uh, yeah, scene. I, that was the that was the first day of the shoot. Oh really? <laughs> Jeez. That, that was the so first you must day have of the felt good. And, <laughs> yeah. and I was improvising in the sense, like you know, also like I, ugly. I did not give my script to the actors. I would give them scenes on the day of the shoot, and mm. I did not want anyone to know what I was doing. And what I did was I gave them all different instructions. I told the father that you're. Like only you are thinking, you think nobody is trying to understand you, so you're constantly trying to explain things in the way it happened, and you're very sincere. So every time you are asked a question, you try to sincerely answer it. You want to, you have to be over zealous and very sincere. I told the actor who's playing his friend that your friend is an idiot. He doesn't understand how to handle the police. He doesn't know how to handle the world. You are a more practical person. You are you are a street smart person. So you have to keep cutting him in between and try to handle things your way. And I told the cop. You don't trust them at all. You think they have done it, so you want them to keep repeating what they're doing, and you ask every tiny, irrelevant question till you see they 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 kind of crack up, and and the scene went on non-stop for fourteen minutes because yeah. nobody would stop, and it stopped only because I couldn't control my laughter and I started laughing and I fell off the chair. <laughs> oh yeah, I I was. I was uh, I, have, I, was, oh, it's, it's, I was dying. I at the end. It's brilliant. I was dying during I have, that I have one take of the film. I have, I have like the first, the very first take, which was non-stop for 14 and a half minutes, which we didn't cut. <laughs> Where I started laughing and you can hear my laughter. I still have that somewhere. That's <laughs> After that, we start try to just borrow from that one take. Oh, well, man. and that does that lends to our question about the way you work with actors and you select your actors because what you just said is very revealing about how you direct your actors because I know a lot of actors would be um, scared to come on set and not have a script, yeah. not know a full objective. They want to create a backstory. They need to know what their why uh, is uh, and everything. Uh, and you just I get that. very scared. All with need, that. Yeah, all you needed to do with uh, them, yeah. but but what's beautiful is all you needed to do in that scene was give everybody a very simple objective, and they trusted you to just yeah. take that. So no, but no, when I I, I I don't work with actors till I form a trust with them or they form a trust with me. Mm, so I yeah. spend a lot of time, like even when I'm working with actors, you see every actor has a trajectory. I have worked with them in a smaller role, where they have seen me how I work. Then I give them a little bigger role before I put them in the center. And when I'm working with absolute newcomers for a first film, where I know I need to work for them, then the minimum they have they wait for the film is three years before they come on board. After they come on board, oh, so wow. most of the film, then, like when they come on board, three years they come, they hang out on the set, they assist, they watch the process yeah. before I start work. And watch how you work. Yeah, because I, yeah. I, if 
if my actors don't trust me, I cannot make the film. Every time I've found had an actor who didn't give me the trust and the faith, things have gone wrong. Hmm. Yeah, well, that, just the way you described the way you directed that yeah. scene, my first thought was, man, those actors had to trust you. <laughs> yeah, they had to. And they gave, me, they gave me a lot of trust. Yeah. yeah. Give me a lot of trust. And, this Mukhabar's film that that I made recently, my actor, I told him, he's the same guy who plays the best friend in Ugly. Mm-hmm. He plays the centerpiece. He mm-hmm. plays the lead in Mukhabar's. Mukhabar's is, is the boxer, it's the brawler. Right? Yeah. Last, check in last film. So I told him, I cannot make a film with you in the lead role because nobody will give me the money. So if you have to make the film in a smaller budget, that means I have to save money on choreographing the boxing. So for that, you have to become a boxer. If you become a boxer, then I can, I'll put real boxers in the ring with you and I'll save money and I can make the film. And he, I sent him off and he went away for a year. He actually became a boxer and he's fighting the Asian champion in the film. And it's all, all the boxing scenes. What I've a shot, great like, story. The way boxing happened. That's wow. phenomenal. The boxing sequence. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, so in, in terms of your casting process, uh, we're both actors, so that's why we're asking a lot of acting questions. It's a long process. Yeah. Um, to, a lot of your films, a lot of, especially some of the smaller characters, it seems that you sometimes just go out on the street and pick somebody who looks like the character that you're trying to portray. So yeah. what, yeah, what is your process with I the casting? Pick out, I pick, pick out actors like that. I find an interesting actor. I know what role I want for him and which film I want to use him. But I, I do it much before the film. I normally do it more than a year in advance. I always mm. find my actors more than a year in advance. Really? And I, I put that in their head. And I get them to prepare. Like, many a times, this actor I worked with in a short film who plays uh, Perpendicular in Gangs of Uh-huh. Mm. And I told him, I said, you want a role in the film? I have a role for you. But you need to learn how to play with a blade in your mouth. So, your only audition process is that. I, know, I trust everything about you. Except... Can you play with the blade in your mouth without it looking like you're making an effort? Or I don't need to do camera tricks. So you have to. And he literally went and learned how to play with the blade in his mouth. That's that is such a. And blessing. he got the role. <laughs> that is that, it, that is, really is. That's because obviously you can already see an actor's talent before you you cast them. Yeah. So you you already know that. But to to give an actor that much time to prepare is a much better, in my opinion, casting process. And it shows in your films, because your it films shows, have shows. some of the most realistic acting we've seen. And we've seen, I think, almost 100 things. We've only been doing this for a little over a year now. Now, we've seen over 100 films. Um, and your films have as far some as the, the Indian most content. Yeah. realistic acting that we've seen out of India. Um, and so that, that it's your, to your credit, I believe, the... Uh, how you, no, how you, the, how you... the actors are like that. And they, they give that time. Also, that, that's also the reason why I work with most times new actors or actors who give me that kind of a time. Actors and music because it's very important. I, I don't know how to create music. Mm-hmm. I need people who give me time. Yeah. I can't work with a music director who's so busy that I'm not in his priority list because I don't have very big budgets. Mm. So I end up working with a newcomer. Or I end up working with people who have that kind of a relationship who will still prioritize me even if I'm I have lesser money for them than what the mainstream industry is giving them. Mm. And so you, I cannot I cannot work with someone who does not prioritize me. So within you, our limited budgets, I have to find people who prioritize me. We saw yes. a thing in uh, on Netflix. It was a Creative Indians, the thing that you did with them. And you said that you're a very happy guinea pig with uh, your your yeah. uh, composers. And so do, yeah. you, you just kind of let, uh, and I love that you let artist be artist. Uh, and since that's that's one of the things I love about you, you kind of just let the artist do their thing, and then you kind of shape it to what you need it to be. But I think that's why your scores are so unique and creative and very different. Because um, like sometimes you'll just have no, no, no. like techno music in the background of a uh, Gangs of Wasper going on uh, <laughs> and it's just <laughs> I just I love it because yeah, it's but so that's different a lot of, that's a lot of credit to Sneha Khan Volker. what like my working process not just with the music it's, it's mostly with everybody is the same I do not tell them what to do I give them very basic instructions information most of the times they don't get a script until much later 
Hmm. But I know what I'm going to make, so I, I take them into the world, and I only tell them what not to do. So I only keep the power of saying no, no with me, but I do not tell them what to do. So including my costume designer, my production designer, and my camera person, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I let them what they want to do the most. Like I ask my cam, I don't tell my cameraman this is the film I want to do, this is how I want to shoot it. I ask him, what's the new camera you want to try? That's mm. the new things you want to try. So this is this is our conversation, and everybody has this thing they've been dying to do, and I genuinely believe that. I have done my best work when somebody has trusted me and let me be. Mm. So that's how I work with my people, and I know when you trust them and you let them be, they don't just have the sense of responsibility that they like so much. They also feel empowered to want to give you so much more. and they also want to do something that they've been dying to do but nobody lets them do because everybody tells them exactly what to do mm mm-hmm. yeah so so yeah. With, even with the music music director like every time i deal with music directors they say every person comes to us and say we want a song like this we want a song like that blockbuster song this is the only one who comes and tells me what do you want to do then mm-hmm. make me hear a sound that's so awesome like i work with uh, we work on the sound first so what is the kind of a sound we are working towards in the movie Mm-hmm. and then we start working on music and songs and till i don't have few songs ready i don't get into the script at all <laughs> mm. <coughs> interesting sometimes 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 like the most famous dialogue from uh gangs of wasepur about kai ke lunga comes because of the song it mm. wasn't the song did not come from the dialogue in the script the dialogue in the script came from the song Hmm. Wow. So yes. so those those are things and that's why I keep the script very flexible. So I yeah. the script written the script is written there and then suddenly uh Sneha recorded the song and the song was gibberish the music was in gibberish and it went like kangaynunga kangaynunga and that's how it sounded like that and suddenly while listening to her gibberish I said you know kekulunga is such a extraordinary expression. Mm. Huh. Wow. Yeah, such an extraordinary expression, and say I say, and then we found that word, and then the song was built around Kekilonga, and then to incorporate that in the film, I rewrote that entire sequence. I love so that. So it's it's a kind of a process that is that everybody is a kind of a collaborator on it. So I yeah. can borrow from everywhere, and I keep adapting to it and keep changing it, and everybody feels like they want to give it their best because they also get the time they want to do it. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Because we've always said film is a collaborative art form, obviously, yeah. and and you really take that to heart, and it shows. And I think that's why your your work shows that it, it's so so good. Yeah, because um, my my screening and my audition happens before people come on board. So like, mm. I'll spend all my time before locking my production designer, before locking my costume person, before locking my team. I spend mm-hmm. and all my time with them. knowing whether they i can work with them or not or whether they'll understand it what my process or not yeah so it's done there after they come on board we're all equals then then they have their own kind of a contribution then they become their own bosses yeah how how important do you think it is cuz you, you obviously you said you don't like acting but you have acted and you know acting and it obviously informs your directing do you think it's important for directors to understand actors and actors oh no, like for me it's it has helped me a lot because my entire process of casting or handling actors is informed by my experience in acting certainly so while i was acting on stage and i was a very proud actor on stage because i know that i was very good and at that time i like most people i also had ambitions of acting and i enjoyed the fact that i was very good and i was getting so much attention mm-hmm. and i got movies very early on mm. when i was very young i was 20 early 20s and i got some movies to act in and i was terrible in them i was like the shittiest actor you see on screen <laughs> so i i could not stand myself i could not watch it and i did four films five films and i just i'm so, so embarrassed i wouldn't talk about it i wouldn't tell people i was in those movies and it was so bad and that's what taught me how not to handle actor because i realized it was because not because i didn't know how to act it was because my director does not know how to work with actors mm. 
So my entire learning of how to deal with actors comes from knowing what not to do with actors. <laughs> yeah, well put. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. I actually, I have a, I have a question. Uh, it's not so much in your films at all, but the. <laughs> <laughs> I know what he's going to ask. You. I've asked this of uh, another director and and Nawaz. <laughs> um, we've seen quite a few. And the one common thread I see with a lot of acting in Indian cinema is that the white actors are so terrible. Uh, any yeah. foreign white actor is we like it's almost it's almost comically bad how they are, and and it's not all the acting like it could be like an Irfan Khan film and he's he's amazing, but then a, a foreign actor comes in and he kind of just shits all over the place. Uh, and so I was wondering yeah. if you knew why that is. Uh, what what, what, what? <laughs> it's, it's a very, very simple thing like you know in, in they, they very rarely cast a white actors in the movie they just mm -hmm. cast a white man in a role uh, and many a time many a times because it's also the equation of rupee versus the dollar or rupee versus the pound mm -hmm. so the the minimum wage of an actor say outside india is what you pay a very successful actor here so in order right. to save money, so you, know, you want a good talent and you respect the talent. So either you pay good money for it or you spend time scrounging through cinema theaters and amongst upcoming actors and find right. a new raw talent who's very good. That makes sense. So they yeah. don't want to. They don't want to spend time and they don't want to spend money. So they end makes up sense. working gotcha. with very bad white actors. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Well, uh, uh, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, yeah, fire yeah. I'll, I'll end it up. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you we'll so much for your time. I, we have a couple like yeah, almost so just much. fast, quick questions for you here, rapid fire, uh, that we just wanted to ask you to uh, end it off here. Uh, so first off, coffee or chai? Coffee. Black coffee. Black coffee. <laughs> well done, sir. I'm with you. Uh, do, do you have a favorite Hollywood film? Oh, I have too many. I like yeah, too many movies. <laughs> name, yeah. na 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 I, name, I like one or too two. many movies. Name huh? one or two that you like. I can. I, you, you give me a decade, or give me a like. I can name favorite filmmakers. I can. I yeah, too favorite, much. Yeah, favorite, favorite, favorite filmmaker. Then Some, one of your favorite filmmakers. Besides Scorsese, my, one of my favorite filmmakers is is minus Scorsese. Yes, my of course. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's obvious. Mom. That's what, you know, I will not talk about Scorsese. We will not talk about Coppola. <laughs> right, right. Among the uh, among the current lot, my my, my favorite film of last twenty years, I can say that of last twenty years from Hollywood is There Will Be Blood. Oh, yeah. And my favorite film worldwide is uh, Memories of Murder. Uh huh. I haven't among seen it, but I know. Yeah, I know. Of it, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's beyond parasites. So, memories of murder. I gotta write that down. And my favorite, uh, my other film that I like so much is Let the Right One In. Uh huh. I haven't seen that uh, one. It's, it's memories of murder. Let the right, it's a it's a kind of a horror made by the guy who made Tinker Tot Taylor Soldier Spy his first film. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 my memory and There Will Be Blood is my favorite. Hollywood film in the last twenty years. Love that film. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis. Is, we love. Is you? Who's? Is he your favorite Hollywood actor? I, I, I saw. It, I saw it at the Dome in LA. Oh, really? <laughs> Only two films I've seen there is uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and They Will Be Blood. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We yeah, the the Dome is awesome. I love the Dome. Uh, yeah. Favorite Hollywood actor? Uh Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Go go ahead, Rick. And otherwise, um, James Cagney. James Cagney? Yeah, wow. Well James done. Cagney. Yeah, because I, I think James, James Cagney, Cagney is the precursor of all later great actors. Because everybody from Jack Nicholson to Pacino to De Niro, I think they kind of come from James Cagney. Yep. Yeah. What, what is one film you think every uh, person, every specifically every film like a writer should watch? Specifically like a writer. Some of the best writing you'd say, a writer, you should watch this if you want to see great screenwriting. Oh, great. I'm saying successful screenwriting is Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> and though the film did not succeed so much. No, but for me, uh, my big, my, I'll talk about my process when I was learning writing. A lot of learning I had from James M. Kane and, and the adaptation of his films. Like, my learning was I read Double Indemnity, then saw the mm -hmm. adaptation of it. I mm -hmm. read 
a portion of drinks twice then i saw all the versions mm-hmm. of it including the chinese version of it then there was mm-hmm. purple rain there's a whole lot of james m kane adaptation mm-hmm. and one of the greatest adaptations according to me was la confidential because i read the entire la quartet james selroy's when i went to la i would go and sit in the restaurant with james selroy i would sit and write the scripts and mm-hmm. i got match boxes from there <laughs> Listen, <laughs> nice uh, but but you see la confidential and la confidential is such a big book mm-hmm. and how intelligently it's been written because they took out a lot of material from the book away and still made a concise film and they created that rollo tamasi they created this it was created by created by the script writer it was not in the original book never in the book wow it was never in the book so that it was probably the most intelligent screenplay adaptation i have seen ever and my my learning of screenwriting is also from reading the books then seeing reading the screenplay then watching the film so that's how mm. i taught myself filmmaking mm. and these are exactly the books and the films and your favorite uh, alcoholic beverage uh i i, I love whiskey and ah. i love wolfburn and i love kilcoman and i am right now having casamigos ah hey, nice <laughs> i love that that's good Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm a I'm a whiskey man. I'm an I'm Irish, so I love all alcohol, but the uh, no, whiskey is whiskey is my whiskey. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I love uh, whiskey number 1 and my tequila or mezcal number 2. So. Mm. Well, thank you so much for for allowing us to uh sit down and have a conversation with you. It's a big honor for us. Uh you're, you're easily uh one of my favorite just directors playing not just Indian. Oh, thank directors. you so much. And I'm, I'm really but I somebody I was sent a link for you. You reviewed Ugly. Yes. And I, I thought you caught on to every single nuance of it, which I was so happy to uh, see that. Thank and you. That's why I said, like, I would love to talk to you, and I, I have to see more of what you've been doing. We it was just oh, so happy. As a filmmaker, I felt so happy that you catch on to every single tiny little thing on it. So one feels oh. very good because a lot of complexity people don't tend to catch. So. Yeah, yeah, that, no, that film yeah. was phenomenal. It was, it was all our honor. We just did the uh, R R two point uh, just yesterday. I'll see that. I'll go check uh, it out because it's, it's yes, so good. But do. thank you so much for sitting down with us. It's a huge honor. If you ever need white actors, you know who to call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, but where, where you guys super... based? Where are you guys based? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Oh, LA. I keep coming to LA. My daughter studies at Chapman. Oh really? Oh, if you're ever here, please, yeah. we would love please to Please look us up. Person. Love to sit down and talk movies. I'll, with you, I'll connect yeah. with you when I'm there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, please thank do. You so please much. do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Have a good one, man. Thank you. Our stupid reactions. Tune in for